enzymes. Who has covered enzymes uh, already in, uh, at school? Hands up. Well, that's uh, all of you. Hey, most of you. Who hasn't? Let me put it this way. Fantastic. Yes, I know there's always somebody. Um, excellent. So, uh, you know what an enzyme is, right? We have an enzyme. That's our enzyme. And usually, we have a substrate. The enzyme does something with the substrate. So that's the enzyme. That's the substrate. And at the end of the reaction, what is typical for an enzyme? It stays unchanged. It stays unchanged, exactly. It comes out exactly the way it was before. And the substrate, obviously, is broken down. Let's symbolize it like that. And that's the product. Um, this part here, what's that called? It's the active site, exactly. So active site. Right. What I want to do with you is talk a little bit about inhibitors. Have you done inhibitors of enzymes? How you can inhibit an enzyme? Have you done it? No, briefly. Briefly. Because mm -hmm. that is something where things very often go completely wrong. And you will find it in many textbooks that... There are some funny things in it. But these inhibitors, they are absolutely essential. They are essential because there is a multi, I would almost say billion pound industry based on it. Whenever you do, whenever you say go to the pharmacy or go to your doctor and get a prescription, inhibitors are involved. If you've got headache, what do you do? You take paracetamol or aspirin. What does that stuff do? Well, actually, we don't know exactly what it does, especially in the case of paracetamol. Uh, but with aspirin, we have a good idea. It inhibits an enzyme. So whenever you take any kind of medication, or, let's say, contraceptive pill, or, you know, whatever. Enzymes are involved. And inhibitors are involved. And we just uh, let them, a sort of a scheme. What I've just drawn with my little... We can write enzyme plus substrate. That gives us usually an enzyme substrate complex. And then it gives us the enzyme. This enzyme can then be recycled, like that. And it gives us the product. This is a common scheme. Just to illustrate what this looks like. <clears throat> I'm an enzyme. That's a substrate. And I have my active site. Now, we have an enzyme structure complex. The enzyme is doing something for the substrate. And if you are absolutely desperate, you can look at the products tomorrow. What? So that is the normal function of the enzyme. Now, where do inhibitors come into play? Well, one kind of inhibitor that is very, very common in the pharmaceutical industry will interact with a free enzyme. So here we have this inhibitor, 
this inhibitor interacts with the enzyme. And we have this reversible reaction, and it forms an enzyme inhibitor complex. Let me illustrate that. I've got my inhibitor here. In this particular case, the inhibitor looks pretty much, pretty similar to my substrate. Right? So, as an enzyme, I now have the option. Either I can bind to my substrate, <coughs> or I can bind to the inhibitor. In this case, they look pretty similar. So, it could very well be that this inhibitor binds also to the active site. Now, <laughs> quite difficult actually. Now, the substrate cannot bind anymore. On the other hand, if I've got the substrate bound, the inhibitor will call for it. So in a way, substrate and inhibitor are mutually exclusive. They can't bind both at the same time. So it makes sense. Yeah? They are actually competing with each other. It's a competition. And that's why this inhibitor is called a uh, competitive inhibitor. And very typical for a competitive inhibitor is that these competitive inhibitors interact exclusively with the free enzyme. Only the free enzyme is the target of the competitive inhibitor. So, we have seen here the inhibitor could look like the substrate and bind to the active site. Lots of pharmaceutical development, of drug development, is based on that. So what people do is they say, okay, let's have a look at, say, the substrate. What does the substrate look like, the shape of the substrate? And then we design something that looks similar to the substrate so that it can bind to the active site but blocks the active site. Thing is dead. That's how the pharmaceutical industry works. There is, however, another way competitive inhibitors can work. There's no substrate. And usually, it's not a problem to bind to the active site. Here's my inhibitor. Does it look like a substrate? No. Would it be able to bind to the active site? No, it shouldn't bind to the active site. But, it can bind to another site on the enzyme. Can bind, for example, yeah. Now this is so painful that the active site, that the protein goes like Ugh. the active site can't bind anymore the substrate. So. This inhibitor also interacts with the free enzyme. It also interacts with the free enzyme, but doesn't look like the substrate at all. This inhibitor binds somewhere else. 
And therefore, anyone here who studied uh, the Greek language? Excellent. What does other mean in Greek? Alos. Alos, exactly. So this is called an allo, allosteric, allosteric. Allosteric means somewhere else on the enzyme. An allosteric binding. It is still a competitive inhibitor because it interacts exclusively with the free enzyme. So for competitive inhibitors, we ha can have two things. Either it binds to the active site, binds to active site, or it binds somewhere else. And is allosteric. But in both cases, it, inter it is mutually exclusive. Either the substrate binds or the inhibitor binds. Yeah? So, but mutually exclusive. between substrate and inhibitor. It's either or. If the substrate is bound, the inhibitor can't bind. If the inhibitor is bound, the substrate can't bind. In both cases. These competitive inhibitors, they are the most common one in the pharmaceutical industry. And because they are quite easy to find and easy to develop. Now, are there any other inhibitors? Well, let's draw our scheme. Enzyme plus substrate. Gives you enzyme substrate. Gives you enzyme plus product. Can you imagine where else could an inhibitor bind? <coughs> Try to figure out. Have a chat. Is that loud? To the substrate. To the substrate. Good idea. Usually, however, we only look at inhibitors that interact with an enzyme part. Yeah? Where else could an inhibitor bind? So it reduces the, um, so it could bind here to this uh, free enzyme. Yeah, where else? To the enzyme substrate. To the enzyme substrate complex. Exactly. It could bind to the enzyme substrate complex. Yeah. So let's do it like that. Inhibitor plus enzyme substrate. And this gives us. What would that give us? Yes. Sorry. Less products, but what would uh, would uh, this this when I just what what would I have to write down here? Hello? Enzyme inhibitor. And exactly, so I have three bits. I have enzyme, substrate, and inhibitor. They're all three sitting there. How on earth could that work? OK. I've got this one, I've got this one, and I'm the enzyme. Now direct me, what do I have to do? Enzyme plus substrate, what do I have to do? OK. And as soon as the substrate binds, a binding site opens on the enzyme. 
And only then, when this binding site is open, the inhibitor can bind, like that. I still have to cut first down and work stop. Can you see what happens? The reaction doesn't get any further because I've got my inhibitor bound. But this inhibitor can only bind when the substrate has bound before. <coughs> so here, because this is completely different to a competitive inhibitor, this guy is actually called an uncompetitive inhibitor. Very different. An uncompetitive inhibitor can only bind when the substrate has bound. Only bind if and when the substrate has already bound. Because what happens is, when the substrate binds, then the protein changes slightly, opens the binding site, and then the inhibitor can bind. Inhibitor can't bind before. My inhibitor is unable to bind to the free enzyme because the binding site is not open. It will only open up when the substrate has bound. Does that make sense? Yeah? These inhibitors, bless you, these inhibitors are bloody difficult to find. The reason for that is because you don't know exactly what they look like. You have to have an enzyme and the substrate together. And usually that's done in, you know, less than a second. So it's very difficult to, to, to get hold of these things. One of these inhibitors that we know of um, is a compound called lithium. Have you heard about lithium chemistry? Yeah. When do you do when when do you give lithium for which condition? When people suffer from uh, manic depression or bipolar syndromes. They very often get lithium uh, because it is an uncompetitive inhibitor to, for an enzyme that changes the, the brain chemistry. But it's one of the really few examples where you have an uncompetitive inhibitor. Does that make sense? So we've got competitive inhibitor. Competitive inhibitor interacts only with the free enzyme. It cannot interact with anything else. It can do that in two ways. It can either bind to the active site or it can be an allosteric inhibitor. Or it can be an uncompetitive inhibitor here which only interacts with the enzyme substrate complex. Yeah? Life would be so lovely if that was all the case. But life's a bitch, and then you die. Why? Well, let's draw that down, or write that down. We have enzyme plus substrate gives us enzyme substrate gives us enzyme plus product. Now here is the big question for you guys. What kind of inhibitor is that? So competitive, yes. What kind of inhibitor is that? It's an uncompetitive. And unfortunately, 
quite often a compound, this I, can do both. It can bind either to the free enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex. It can do both. Weird stuff, but it's possible. How are we going to call that guy? So that would be a competitive here. It's an uncompetitive. Any good names? Indifferent. Sorry? Indifferent. Indifferent. Yeah? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's good. Yeah? Any other? Uh, my uh, impression of a cocktail mixer is not very good, I guess. <coughs> Loud. Mixing. It's a mixed inhibitor. Excellent. We have a mixed inhibitor. A mixed inhibitor can do both. And we usually say, with a mixed inhibitor, it depends. So a mixed inhibitor, it can be that the competitive component is stronger than the uncompetitive component. So it favors slightly binding to the free enzyme. That is when the competitive component is strong. Could be the other way around. It could be the uncompetitive component is stronger than the competitive. This is when the inhibitor, what does the inhibitor favor? Where does it want to go? The uncompetitive, in this case, where does it want to go? It wants to go to the enzyme substrate complex, yeah? Bind stronger to that. Are you happy with that? No? Yeah? Makes sense. And unfortunately, in some textbooks, you also have the case where the competitive component is exactly the same it's exactly the same as the uncompetitive component. In reality, this never happens. There's always a slight difference between competitive and uncompetitive. But because all these textbooks have been written by people who are not enzym enzymologists, they decided to come up with another name for that, which completely gives me the creeps. The name for that is a non-competitive inhibitor. Now, immediately forget that I told you that. Because non-competitive inhibitors, in my humble opinion, just simply do not exist. And if somebody is trying to sell you a non-competitive inhibitor, hello, uh-huh, if somebody is trying to sell you a non-competitive inhibitor, you just stick two fingers up and say, sorry, that clapper guy told me that a non-competitive inhibitor doesn't exist. You either have a competitive or an uncompetitive or a mixed inhibitor. Yeah? And I know that a lot of my teacher colleagues will cringe inwardly because that is a very common exam question. Describe what a non-competitive inhibitor does. So you just simply say there's a mixed inhibitor 
with a competitive and an uncompetitive component where both components are the same. End of. That makes sense to you? I have two minutes left, and I want to show you a third inhibitor. Oh, is it a fourth? I completely forgot. Um, Now, uh, no, 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 I need to, need to, need to, need to, right, now, imagine, here is our active site, yeah, and I'm a substrate, so, I bind to the active site, and the enzyme does something. Okay? Easy to understand. Now, Jack is also a substrate. Me first, me first, me first. Did you see what happened? If we have substrate at a low level, the reaction can happen. If we have too much substrate, they start fighting over the active site. Too much substrate can block the active site. It's just an overload. It's a little bit like two hedgehogs trying to go through the same <coughs> little hole in the, in the garden fence. It doesn't work. What would you say the substrate is? Is it the substrate in this case? Is it like a competitive inhibitor? Or is it like a uncompetitive inhibitor? It's tricky, isn't it? Who thinks it is like a competitive inhibitor? Hands up. Because it's not binding. It's not. Uh huh. Who thinks it's like an enzyme substrate binding uncompetitive inhibitor? Uh huh. Well, actually, the jury is out. It's not really clear what how should, how we should treat it, and therefore, therefore, this thing has been given the name of a very imaginative name. It's called, what, do you, what, what would you call it? Substrate inhibition. Can happen very often. If you just chuck in too much substrate, the reaction happens much slower or doesn't happen at all. And people say to me, bloody hell, I just added so much substrate and it gets slower. Why? Mm -hmm. Substrate inhibition. Try it with less substrate, you'll see, much easier. Does that make sense to you? So, what I showed you today are competitive inhibitors where they compete <coughs> with a substrate, bless you, or rather competitive inhibitors bind exclusively to the free enzyme. Uncompetitive inhibitors where the inhibitor only can bind once the substrate has bound. And a mixture of these things. Mixed inhibitors. Forget the non-competitive. Don't want to hear that ever, ever, ever again. Terrible. Just a quick one. Um, we've been learning, this is going to make me cringe even more, yeah. that the um, uncompetitive is the non-competitive.
Yes. And that is. Ah! <laughs> this is. That's what's in the book. That's what's in the book. And that is why I would say the book is complete and utter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? A non competitive inhibitor and an uncompetitive inhibitor have as much with each other to do as carrots and parsnips. So, for example, for our board, what, what do we do? Right. I was slightly worried about that question. However, if a question like that comes up and you don't get full marks when you say an uncompetitive inhibitor interacts with the enzyme substrate, a non-competitive inhibitor is an inhibitor that is mixed. And if you don't get full marks for that, talk to me. That make sense? Yeah? Non-competitive inhibitors are, are like... Flying pigs. Unfortunately, in that case, for the stu in the students' case, you'd have to request scripts back for the students yep. to know that that's where they lost the mark. So it's not a simple decision to say, give that out and come to you. Uh, I, I know, I, I, and I would hope <laughs> that nobody comes to me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it is also... That's why I'm very, very glad that we have a few teachers here. That when these things are taught, my hope is that they will be taught properly. Because I have hell of a time with a student in my enzymology course, first year, to eradicate this concept of non-competitive inhibitors. Because everybody goes, oh yeah, I know, this is non-competitive bollocks. Right? Doesn't exist. And we have tried for many, many, many years to the, the, the uh, Royal Chemical Society and, 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 and things like that. They have tried to eradicate this nonsense. But for one reason or the other, many textbooks, not all of them, many textbooks still insist on presenting wrong things. So my call to the teachers is, please, please, please ensure that the students don't learn rubbish. I don't know who is marking the, the A-level uh, papers. They're, they're, they're sent to just teachers around the country. You, you get the marks back, mm -hmm. but you're not mm -hmm. necessarily sent the scripts back. You can request them mm -hmm. in the next school term mm -hmm. that for people that might be, mm -hmm. I don't know, resitting or anything. Yeah. Yeah, sort of go back and challenge that I'm sorry that I've confused you. But that's the truth and nothing but the truth about enzyme inhibitors. So what are you going to do in uh, the practical is we are not looking particularly at inhibitors but we are looking at inhibition of enzymes. And enzymes usually work only in a certain pH range. You heard about pH, yeah? So for certain enzymes, they want the pH to be very acidic. Can you think of an enzyme that likes it very acidic? Protein. A protein? Well, yes. But not all proteases like it acidic. Can you think of one? Pepsin. Pepsin. Yes, where do you find pepsin? Stomach. It's in the stomach. <coughs> pepsin, stomach, stomach very acidic, pH 1 to 2. The enzyme works very well there. Yeah? Can you think of an enzyme that likes it very alkaline? Amylase, oh, no, that's, uh, that's around seven-ish, seven to eight, yes. Um, actually, I can't really think. Uh, oh, well, um, cholinesterase, but 
let's, let's not dwell on that. But what's important to realize, if we, for example, plot, here's our pH, here's the low pH, here's the high pH, and we measure enzyme activity, what we very often will find is that an enzyme has an activity like that, a hump. And that simply means that at this particular pH here, the enzyme is most active. Okay? And that is exactly what we are going to do today. So you will get solutions with different pH. And you use three milliliter of the different solutions. three milliliter of different solutions, and these solutions have already the right pH and they have the substrate in it. And you add to these three milliliters, you add 30 microliter of enzyme. Thirty microliter of enzyme. And then you see how quickly the substrate disappears, or rather, how quickly the product is generated. And what you do is, you have little cubettes. Have you worked with cubettes? Yeah, some of you have. You put the three milliliter into that, you put this cuvette into the spectrophotometer and the demonstrators will show you how to do that. And then you set the spectrophotometer to zero. It should show zero uh, reading. There's nothing going on. Then you carefully pipette 30 microliter of the enzyme solution onto a sort of a paddle on a stick. It's a little bit like the sticks that you get at Starbucks. Yeah? And this 30 microliter you add to this 3 milliliter, mix it a little bit, close the spectrophotometer, and then you start recording what you see. You will see that the reading of the spectrophotometer will change. And every 15 seconds, you write down the reading. So at the beginning, at the start, the reading should be 0 0.000. After 15 seconds, it is 0 0.01, maybe. After 30 seconds, it's 0 0.02. Yeah? After 45 seconds, What do you expect? Sorry, I'm in the way. Yep. After 10 minutes? <coughs> Never mind. What we can do then is we can calculate how fast this changes per minute. So we can ch measure so after 60 seconds, for example, this would be 0 0.04. So we can say, OK, it changes in these 60 seconds. It changes about 0 0.04 per minute. Yeah? And I want you to record that for different pHs. Usually, you would only record it for, say, two minutes or so, because then it gets boring. Can you do that? You understand the task? Any questions? God, I'm good. Yes? Is there a question about your, uh, the, the inhibitor that was available to the other side? What would you call it? That would be an allosteric inhibitor. Yeah, 
That is absolutely right, but the allosteric inhibitor interacts exclusively <coughs> with the free enzyme. The criteria for an inhibitor is not whether it binds to the active site or not. The criterion for an enzyme inhibitor is does it bind to the free enzyme or does it bind to the enzyme substrate complex? It has nothing to do with the active site. It just stops it. Uh, in the case of the allosteric inhibitor, it stops the reaction because it introduces a change, a conformational change in the protein so that the substrate can no longer interact with the active site. Does that make sense? So it has nothing to do with the active site. And that is where a lot of the textbooks are, are going wrong. The criterion is, does it bind to the free enzyme or does it bind to the goodbye, enzyme substrate? If you want to have a... Uh, I've just recorded that, the whole thing that I've done. Uh, and I will put it up on YouTube. Are you happy with that? Well, you, you are not identifiable uh, from that. If you want to watch it again, my channel on YouTube is PK11 Kent. Or you can uh, also email me if you have questions, p.clapper <coughs> at Kent. A-C-U-K. Or you can also find me on Facebook. <laughs> Peter Klapper. Or <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> PK underscore Kent. Clear as mud? Thank you very much. And I'll see you in the practical. <laughs>